Hello and welcome to our holiday theme ish episode of the Anime Explorations Podcast. I'm Alex. I'm David. And I'm Tora. Hear the music. Now that the dance of the dolls has begun. And this month we are discussing Nutcracker Fantasy. Figured it's the holiday season, we're gonna keep things a little lighter, and there's not a lot of holiday themed dedicated holiday themed anime. Um it's and since the Nutcracker, the story of the Nutcracker is frequently used for the holidays as a holiday story. This seemed like an appropriate work to do. So we are covering the 1979 stop motion animated film from Sanrio, that is the Hello Kitty people of Nutcracker Fantasy. And we did love that uh, Hello Kitty cameo in there. <laughs> Indeed. They were quite restrained, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sanrio during the 1970s and 80s, particularly the 70s, had a, definitely had a much wider range of stuff. You had stuff like this. You had their collaborations with Tezuka Productions, like Ringing Bell, and that sort of thing. So... This is, this has actually previously gotten been gotten a U.S. release way back in the day, contemporaneously, like 1970s, 1980s, and this has probably the most all-star English dub cast of anything we've covered thus far. It's, yeah, we have Sir Christopher Lee in three roles. Um, we have um, Eva Gabor. Uh, who you may recognize, or listeners may recognize from the Rescuers films, in addition to being related to uh, Zsa Zsa. Um, and we have Roddy McDowell, who was in a ton of things, um, including the uh, numerous Planet of the Apes films. Yeah. it. No, I was just going to say, yeah, fantastic cast doing their best yeah very clearly these were not professional voice actors and christopher lee probably done like christopher lee and roddy mcdowell i think it actually a fair amount like, actually of the cast we have at least three who are definitely had significant voice acting experience um at this point christopher lee had done some voice acting work at this point um because i think he'd also done i want to say he'd done um, the last unicorn at this point. We'll have to double check the release date of that. Um, Eva had done Rescuers, I think, because I think Rescuers was in was mid seventies. Um, I don't think we'd gotten um, Roddy McDowell in the uh, in the Rankin Bass uh, Return of the King yet. Because he was Samwise in that, um, but he certainly would have had to loop everything, all of his dialogue for um, Planet of the Apes at this point. Um, so, some experience there. Um, so, I'd like to talk about the elephant in the room, which is if you grew up in America and you start watching this, one of your first thoughts is going to be. Oh, this looks just like the Rankin Bass Christmas specials that are on TV every year ad nauseum. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> this film inspired me to do some research. Um, so it uses the same animagic single frame stop motion puppet style animation that the Rankin Bass specials did. And there's a reason for that as well. Um, Rankin Bass outsourced all of their animation to different animation studios around the world, most of which were in Tokyo, Japan. And the studio that made Nutcracker Fantasy had previously done work for Rankin Bass. Um, the director on this project had worked on some of those aforementioned Rankin Bass productions. Um, so I was very surprised to learn that all of the Rankin Bass work, like the making of the puppets, the making of the backgrounds, and all of the animation was done in Japan for the most part. I think that's something that most people are unaware of, and I found that very interesting. <laughs> yep. I felt like watching this, though, 
Like, having also grown up with those Rankin Bass animated specials, while the quality of the stop motion animation itself is for both is pretty good, it felt like there was a degree of fluidity to like the facial expressions and that sort of thing for Nutcracker Fantasy that felt very different to an extent. It helped that the that the designs, while stylized, still had a bit more grounded look to them, as opposed to the deliberately kind of aiming for much younger kids for like Santa Claus is coming to town or um with uh Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, both of which are very, very, a very good animation, stop motion animation to them. But I also definitely feel like here there's a bit of, we're not doing this aimed for American children, or like deliberately target for American children, the American TV market, so we can kind of let our imagination run free for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and honestly, it, it like it feels very similar, but it also feels very, very different just from a because if the, I honestly didn't really like this much, I felt that there were a lot of pacing issues, uh, a lot of thing, a lot of scenes just go on too long. <laughs> and it does that thing that many 70s animated thing uh specials will do where there's some live action bit in this case uh ballet dancing straight out of uh tchaikovsky but that it's it those scenes felt very out of place to me <laughs> it's always very difficult to integrate a completely different style of filmmaking right so uh, an infamous example would probably be the star wars holiday special <laughs> and and that so in that case it feels a little bit dated, a little bit 70s because of the insertion of this live action footage. I will say that they redeemed it a little bit because the entire movie has a very surreal dreamlike quality, which I feel is very much intentional. Um, and so they kind of framed it as sort of dream within a dream kind of sequences. Only for one of them, though. Oh. <laughs> the other one, it was... <laughs> yeah. But I will agree that there are pacing issues. If you watch a lot of animation like I do, um, particularly later generation stop motion, like from Leica Studios, and um, if you look at Del Toro's uh, Pinocchio that just came out, there are possibly frame rate issues. This could have been intentional and stylistic, but I will say that there are, there are definitely moments where the characters will freeze in a completely a natural way, like before going on to the next frame of movement. The characters rarely blink, which is kind of one of my pet peeves in animation. I was just kind of staring at the puppet, like blink, blink, blink. <laughs> but yeah, I will, I, I am a huge fan of stop motion. I will say that the creativity and the design I really enjoyed Oh, yeah. Even though some of the characters maybe played a little bit into ethnic stereotypes. A little bit. <laughs> but it was the 70s, you know? I'm just going to write that off as a product of the times. Also Japan, which has never had the best relationship with stereotyping. Admittedly, that's also a problem wanna... with the Nutcracker oh, as a source material as itself. Like, if you look at the ballet, like, there is, like, the chunk in the middle of it where you're... Or where... um in like the if you're watching the any of the ballet versions where Clara has come to the with Fritz with Franz the, the, the Nutcracker to the to his kingdom and the various princes and uh, meet the emissaries from all the various countries and you have pieces of music that are deliberate pastiches of different that are meant to be somewhat of yes, pastiches very much. of ethnicities yeah. and the dances play into that. I mean that it's an excellent point, but the movie strays so far from the original source material in a number of other places. It felt a little odd to keep it in for these like two scene characters, caricatures, really. So um, our son, who is six, almost seven years old, sat with us for some of the film and he was laughing nonstop throughout the whole scene with the wise men. Um so it, it's very possible that it just hits differently for a kid. 
And I'm pretty sure he was just laughing because of all the ridiculous stuff going on. Like at one point, someone pours tea into an open book and there's an explosion with a chemistry set and, um, you know, all this wacky stuff. I think the <laughs> I think the ethnic stereotyping went right over his head, but you can never be yeah. sure, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's true. Like I, I was watching it this time. There was a certain degree of, oh, yikes going on through, through, through that sequence. <laughs> but I also recognize yeah. there was enough slapstick going on there yeah because I, I was watching it and i had imdb out and i'm like okay 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 you, you're that person you're that person wow all these very ethnic wise men are all voiced by just a few white guys doing different voices and i'm with eh. very exaggerated accents <laughs> oh. it's like shades of even more racist step who <laughs> yep so th- that's something to watch out for yeah <laughs> But yeah, like it. But as we said, it's just they're only in two scenes, and only in one of them are they actually talking. The other is the big celebration at the end. I have to point out that one of the characters in that scene is a dark-skinned woman with a big nose who looks exactly like the Gerudo in the Legend of Zelda. <laughs> she even has the curled-up toe shoes. Um, so long I- ponytail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's there's clearly some kind of cultural image happening there. <laughs> or influence from this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Timeline wise, I think this came first, yeah. <laughs> um, definitely. Yeah. Very much so. Um, <laughs> like it is interesting, like I, I picked this for Chris for, for our, our Christmas movie without admittedly not having seen it before. So I was coming in completely clo- uh, cold. So like, there is a certain degree of holiday trappings that I expected to see from, um, that I've grown some use, so used to seeing from the Nutcracker. That I was surprised absolutely not to see it, not seeing it there. Like, I'm used to the big visual, for example, from the ballets of uh, the big Christmas tree and the holiday party and that sort of thing. Um, leading into, yeah. um, with the, when we get to the battle with the mice of Clara shrinking and the tree growing huge. It's like one of the, that's probably one of the classic sort of ballet showbiz visuals out there uh, for forms of set pieces and not having that there and instead having it be uh, Clara crawls into a, a grandfather clock like um, Alice chasing the rabbit. Um, very different. I also loved that they turned the Rat King into a two-headed rat queen named Morphia. 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 Yeah, that was giving me like shades of Sentai shows, which I really appreciated. <laughs> it was a cool design, too. Yeah, I mean. The way they animated her head separately, they were always doing something different. <laughs> so I watched this with both the uh, uh, with the Japanese voice first and then some of the English dub. Did you watch um, just English? We watched the dub because we were watching with the six-year-old. Who Luke? He he does watch uh, sub shows with us, but he can't for very long. Yeah. So how did Luke Eldridge's son handle the um, uh, attack on um, Queen Morphia's um, uh, true um, palace by the uh, uh, army? That sequence that was like surprisingly kind of horrors of war for a children's show. It was Horrors of War, very much so, but they also, it was, you know, explained over and over again, they're toys. They're dolls, yeah, the kingdom of the dolls. Um, He didn't didn't seem to care one way or the other, honestly. Um, I think part of that is the animation style. Like, it, it kind of looks like playing with toys a little bit. And then part of that is just... At this point in the film, he was getting a little bored and he quickly scampered off to do something else. But <laughs> I remember w- yeah. watching that sequence and like that last shot of that is like Clara just looking on with this absolute look of abject horror at the at the carnage laid out before. Her. I'm like, wow, like this is not, this is like, remarkably heavy for a kid for a kid's movie, sort of. But then again, I've seen I've read some synopses of some of Sanrio's other stuff again like ringing bell so I'm not too surprised but then again this 
this got more of an English release than Ringing Bell did in the day. I also feel like children's productions in the 70s and 80s hit a lot harder um, than a lot of children's productions today. They were not afraid of emotional extremes. And I think that... And for very good reason. Yeah, for very good reason. There's there's a psychological basis behind that. You know, yeah. having your kids experience these things with a fiction before it happens to them in reality. Um, <laughs> no matter how traumatizing that may be for some children, I looking know. at you. <laughs> I know. As a parent, I personally am like, like, I don't want my son to see the land before time. It made me so sad as a child and stuff like that. But in, in kind of a similar fashion, I think... Kids today are more exposed to globalization, exposed to the whole world at an early age, unless they're very, very sheltered. Um, And I think they can handle it, actually. I mean, a lot of us grew up on 80s children's movies, and we're relatively fine. I mean, most people are relatively fine, right? Not a tragedy in those, (laughs) deliberately. Although this gets I mean, into a lot of things I'm not qualified to talk about, but I have read extensively about as a parent. <laughs> I mean, I definitely know that uh, wasn't land before time, but um, uh, oh, go up Queen- to anyone our age and you're like, "What traumatized you as a child?" <laughs> I mean, he, he, I mean, he does get emotional when watching stuff like Queen uh, mm-hmm. Queen Glimmer. No, not Queen Glimmer. Queen Angela's uh, death in uh, mm-hmm. She-Ra. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess I the would... first time. <laughs> I, I would bring that back to topic by saying that um, the sequence was dark, but I don't think it was out of place for a children's production of the era. Like, I've seen worse, I want to say. <laughs> it, yeah. Like... The animation style does blunt the emotional effect because it looks like toys, and within the text, it's explicitly stated that it's the kingdom of the dolls. So, and the hu- and the human-ish soldiers all have equi- uh, Disney deaths, you know, pushed into a pit. You never see the bottom. Just swarmed by rats, though. That was a little whoa. <laughs> yeah, but but we you know we saw him escape. So, <laughs> what well, Tilly was turned into a doll. Yeah. I think as an adult, for me, the the kind of hardest hitting emotional moment of the film is when um, Clara returns to the princess and says, yes, everything turned out great for you, but not for Franz. Um, and the princess is just like, oh, no, that doll's ugly. I'm not marrying it. And throws him on the floor. <laughs> Clara's just like, he died for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it all turns out all right in the end. Because it was all just a dream. That's another hallmark of children's productions of this era. (laughs) All just a dream, except for the very end, where the grown man shows up to marry the child. (sighs) Also, are we going to talk about the fact that Franz... It's, it's 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 a revolutionary girl Utena moment there, like, and clearly this came first, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. I, actually, I would even I'm saying I might even go a little further than that um, to the other work that probably heavily influenced Utena, which was um, Rosa Versailles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which, uh, incidentally, we are very much looking forward to watching. <laughs> and and actually, the guy who voiced Franz and Fritz is in the in, on the Japanese dub um, is the voice of Andre in Rosa Versailles. So I had this moment. Yeah. Of, so I had this moment. Like, Boy, this is a real Rosa Versailles like vibe from this guy. And then, they, and then I was looking up all the the voice actor information and anime news network before we started recording. And I looked up uh, Fritz's Japanese voice actor. Like, oh, he voiced uh, Andre and Rosa uh-huh. Versailles. I mean, these are both the same year, but I can still see them going. Oh yeah. <laughs> Get there you go. <laughs> Where, where did this pink-haired prince archetype come from? <laughs> oh, I actually know the origin of the Bisho- uh Yeah, Bishonen. It was a single Dutch actor who was like 14 years old. Um, oh, what is his name? Uh, but basically, uh, his movies were really, really big in Japan, where he was this beautiful 14-year-old kid. Slightly X. Uh, very androgynous looking. 
He actually was in Midsommar not terribly long ago. Wow. Oh, so cool still working. Guy. Good to good to hear that. Yeah, still working. Still acting. That's cool. <laughs> um, so interesting thing about the, the marriage bit of the plot, real quick. Uh, in the Japanese mm-hmm. version, that is left very ambiguous. Um, oh, thank goodness. Uh, it's like like at the last shot of the movie, like we get the um, this visual of the two, two pink spotlights crossing over the two characters, which we had right. earlier in the film with um, Clara and. Fritz, the, the, the Nutcracker. Uh, and then, or the friends, and then and we get that repeated here, but we don't get any of that explicit voiceover narration by adult Clara um, flashing back to this. Uh-huh. It's also, interesting. as part of this, like the uh, whole bit from the beginning with the um, uh, uh, what's his face? The um, Ragman. Like, that's actually even feels a little like it's it's a non sequitur in both. Yes, it very much is. But it almost feels like like it feels a bit more of that in the dub because it's Clara giving the story, adult Clara giving the story, whereas in the Japanese version, it's um, Clara's aunt who is uh, giving the story instead. Um, oh. and as her art, as her go, as her go to bed or else the rag man will get you. Thing. Okay. So it's more of a framing device in the Japanese version. And then in the English dub, it kind of just comes up in the beginning and then is never spoken of again. It, it, it's also never spoken of again in the Japanese version either. It's just, um, it just, Ed Gerda mentions it and we get this flash <laughs> sequence, this brief sequence. Um, with the rag band fighting a kid who stayed up late and reading and turning him into a rat, and then nothing further comes of that. See, now that I'm thinking about it sitting here, I want to know if, like, all of the mice and rats in the Rat Queen's army were transformed children. <laughs> like, what is that about? <laughs> that puts a different complexion on things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, given that when he arrives, Uncle uh, Drosselmeyer. Drosselmeyer, I want to say Osselmeyer. I was like, that's not right. It's not Rosselmeyer. Uncle Drosselmeyer is looks just like the Ragman when he shows up. He's a lot of characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes, uh, the first uh, Bishonen was Bjorn Andresen. Look up the pictures. It's really interesting. <laughs> I'll see if I can Just find some pictures of that and put them in the show notes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking of um, other casting things and that sort of thing, like I was really impressed with Christopher Lee's like from the bits of the uh, dub I listened to. I was really impressed with Christopher mm-hmm. Lee's performance because this is this is Christopher Lee absolutely playing against type. Um, like I'd heard him sing before. There was a. Um, musical pastiche superhero movie he did, The Return of Captain Invincible, where he played the villain in that. Uh, and he has this famous musical number where, so the brief synopsis, the, the premise of this movie is Captain Invincible was a superhero from back in the day um, and was driven out of the profession in disgrace for various reasons, and he's had alcoholism. And Christopher Lee is his place as arch nemesis. And th- this is all a full musical. And there's this musical number where he is trying to get the main get Captain Invincible to fall off the wagon and singing about various cocktails and booze and that sort of thing to get him to drink. It's really hilarious. Um but so like but he, you know, it's still villainous and sinister. Whereas in the English dub of this, he's much more kindly and paternal and that sort of thing, which is Something I I'd never really seen from Christopher Lee before. I'd seen him I'd seen him as Saruman. I'd seen him as Dracula. I'd seen him as uh, the Count in the Last Unicorn. Um, I'd seen him. All- it's almost against type for the character too, because Drosselmeyer in most of the other productions of the Nutcracker is is always framed as a sinister figure, even though he doesn't really do anything sinister. Um, he's just always kind of costumed and presented as a as a dark figure, 
And I think that's true in this film as well. Um, but yeah, Christopher Lee does a tremendous job kind of switching between the different incarnations or characters that this puppet is presenting. It's very, very cool. And, and his singing, I mean, I'd heard him sing before. Um, I listened to his Christmas album. Um, I listened to some of his heavy metal albums. Um, and But this is like a wide, much wider range of styles. He has something that's a little more um, Spanish influenced in the sort of middle portion of the movie. Um, when Clara is going to speak to the Queen of Time, when he points her in that direction uh, and that sort of thing. And it actually makes me wish we'd gotten more vocal stuff if, if more people had realized, oh, hey, Christopher Lee isn't just tall, dark, and spooky. Um, he can, he has tremendous rage as an actor. And like, mm -hmm. like come to think about it, like the first movie they recall that him being like just straight comedy and not in a sinister fashion necessarily was like Gremlins Two. He's a scientist in that. Well, does it does it count if it's comedy, but it's not intentionally so? Because his role in that uh, made-for-television Captain America movie in the seventies was hilarious i mean and he clearly was the only person who knew he was making trash i mean i've seen some of the italian movies that he's that he did um well, as far as horror yeah. horror films <laughs> plus i mean his plus the hammer films more more than a few of which where he went this dialogue is terrible i refuse to say it i am going to go through the movie saying as little about lines as possible and just standing there <laughs> looking spooky um, which, which worked for him, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I protest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I mean, the, the reason I said at the beginning that all the voice actors are just doing their best is because the, the cast is tremendous. Like they do a great job. Um, sinking it to the animation is never an easy task, but I feel especially with the character of the Chamberlain who thankfully does not have very many lines. He, he is animated in a very, very kind of jerky, comedic way that makes it really hard to sync up dialogue. Um, <laughs> the, the, the voice, they were, they were doing their best, um, but it kind of threw me out of immersion a little bit to, to see the Chamberlain act because it just wasn't, wasn't smooth. And I think you mentioned the concept of fluidity earlier on in the podcast and I mean, the the whole thing taken as a whole work does have kind of a very fluid, dreamlike quality, which I really appreciated, which was appropriate to the story they were telling. Um, and that's why certain things do seem kind of especially out of place, I feel. Uh, even if you discount throwing in the live action sequences, which you can. I mean, you just explain them away as dream sequences within an extended dream sequence. Um, there are parts that are just kind of completely uh, out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> and part of it is attributable to the pacing issues that David mentioned. Um, and, and part of it is just, you're, you've got this very surreal, dreamlike, dramatic stuff happening. And then, oh, here's a comedy sequence with all these wacky characters from around the world. And it's this very comedic character bumbling around. And uh, it, it is all very fantasy, of course, but it's it's not necessarily flowing together at all points, I would say. Yeah, it feels like it's one person's vision, but they're able to see things that didn't make it into the script or the film. Yeah. Or there were technical limitations. Or there were technical yeah. <laughs> limitations. It, it just seems like the script should they should have gone over the script um one or two more times before they started actually working on it or it seems like maybe they had things in the script that they just weren't able to do and they didn't edit appropriately because what is there is pretty ambitious yeah yeah i mean i mean when you look at the work just by itself i mean they do some very very impressive things like yeah <laughs> Looking at, I think one of my favorite bits was all of the uh, the tin, the toy soldiers getting all wound up. Yeah, literally winding the winding the keys. 
I think the movie is at its most <laughs> impressive when it is playing to the animation style, right? Mm-hmm. So that sequence where the soldiers are all getting wound, that kind of jerky stop and go motion, which is so endemic to stop motion animation, fits in beautifully. Um, the sequence with the Palace of Dreams and all of the dancing food, which is where Hello Kitty makes her cameo. Um, I loved that sequence um, because they kind of shot it like it's a it's a bunch of toys and dishes and foods on a table that just suddenly start dancing. It's very fantasy, very little girl's dream. Um, and then, you know, the the battle sequence that we talked about previously, that was actually incredibly well staged and well edited. Um, you know, oh. the way it was cutting back and forth between the, the soldiers going down, the rats swarming them, the queen extorting her soldiers... Um, Commander's ordering, wind the troops! Wind the troops! Yeah, that, that was that was great. <laughs> uh, uh, the, so the director of this, uh, this is his only directing credit, uh, Takeo Nakamura. Um, he had done some recording production work um, about 15, about, yeah, 15 years previously on uh, the adaptation of Osamu Tezuka's Big X, which was a uh, superhero anime. Um, and the writer of this was, uh, Shintaro, uh, Suji, who was the founder of Sanrio. Um, and this is, well, he had exec, this is his first story credit for going from Anime News Network. Uh, he'd done other production before this, again, for, um, Unico and Ringing Bell, but a lot of those were also, like, Osamu Tezuka joints. Protection from editors, never a good thing for a production. Um, but yeah, like this, like, I, I definitely could see, like, with the direction on this and the writing, like, with the added bits from, like, the um, Ragman and for how long the um, scene with the Wisemen go. I'm looking at the runtime, too. I'm like, this is an 82 minute movie. Like, if you cut those out, I could definitely see them going. This movie is actually too short for theaters. Um, mm-hmm. we, we need to have these in here or else the movie will be too short. And, and possibly we yeah. can't get this sold over overseas. Yeah, that it, it, it's it's weird, but my feeling is the movie is too long. But if they added more to it, it would definitely be better. It, it, it's weird as it stands. I, I feel that you know things go too long. There's too many pacing issues. But if they could put more in there, that would probably help. A little more, add a little more to the fluidity, so that there are there are some bits that are very abrupt, and I think they could smooth those out. Uh, I, yes, I I think like the bits that run long, like the Ragman and the Wise Men, like. Those can be shorter, and the bits that get cut a little too short, um, like some of the stuff with Queen Morphia, um, some of the stuff with Clara and friends, like they like we have surprisingly little Nutcracker in this Nutcracker movie. Indeed. I know. Um, I remember going into this. I'm like, well, I mean, we we both really know the story of the Nutcracker. So this isn't really going to be about the story. It's going to be about, you know, looking at the animation and examining how they're telling it. But no, this was its own story. Very much inspired by a fever dream you ha- you had after you watched the Tchaikovsky play. <laughs> I mean, there is supposedly like, like a novel by T- E.T.A. Hoffman that mm. is like sort of spun off um or, or other that, that that the ballet is based on the nutcracker and the mouse king um but even then yeah this is still taking a fair number of liberties from it like um the, the novel is set on starts on christmas eve and again there's very little christmas in this movie mm-hmm. yeah but overall I can't really recommend this movie to anyone, to everyone, but if you like the Nutcracker, it's an interesting take on it. Yeah, I think the story is interesting. And um, if you're interested in the history of film or in animation, I think it's worth checking out. Um, 
it is part of that kind of grand history of stop motion. Mm. Um, and also, I found it extremely interesting to watch in terms of broadening my perspectives of the history of animation in Japan specifically. Um, and I wasn't aware until recently that they did all of these um, collaborations or work for the Western animation market and how then Japanese animators who worked on, for instance, the Rankin Bass Christmas specials would then go on to found strictly Japanese animation houses. Um, so there's just a lot of interesting things to unpack there. And going through this movie, I kept calling out in my head references to anime that I had seen, which were made after this film and wondering how much of it was specific reference to this film and how much of it was um, kind of cultural archetypes that kind of pervaded Japanese animation or TV at this time. And so there's just, um, there's a lot to look at from a scholarly perspective, I guess I'm saying, and that makes it sound boring, but it's actually really interesting. <laughs> I definitely agree. Like this is a movie where, because it is available for streaming on Crunchyroll and on, in particularly on Retro Crush, if you aren't subscribed to Crunchyroll already, um, that and thus Retro Crush be able to watch it free with ads. That I'd appreciate having these available through those avenues, so for people to watch with that relic with the a sunk cost of time as opposed to sunk cost of twenty five, thirty, forty bucks for a deep, for a Blu Ray. Mm -hmm. um, and let's makes this more available to audiences who would not necessarily have a chance to take the opportunity to watch it in this way. One last thing, huge shout out to the people at the Japanese animation company who made the puppets and sets because that craftsmanship is incredible. Yes. Absolutely. I, I, I loved the set design so much um, and, and the costume designs. Even the somewhat cringe -y ethnic ones, you know, still beautiful design. <laughs> well, incredibly well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so checking quickly on IMD, not IMD, but on Anime News Network, for the ones who have other credits um, for, um, for puppet design, one of the... Uh, uh, designers with other credits is Sadio Miyamoto, who worked on, um, among other things previously, Princess uh, Knight, which also, um, in fact, that was, her, that was um, her first big credit, which makes sense considering the, again, the design of uh, Friends. Um, and would also proceed to, after this, to work, actually before this, to work on Gatchaman the movie and Gatchaman 2. Uh, as animation director. In fact, basically, they, they go on to become a, a animation director and a whole bunch of other big stuff, including, again, lots of the Gatchaman franchise through um, the 80s. Nice. Mm -hmm. And the live act and some of the set design, I think this might be just for the live action sec sections, though, um, was by Hiroshi Yamashita, who also worked on the live action Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. Which I have watched. Yes. Very enjoyable, I must say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of fun. And yeah, just <laughs> honestly, if you got no problem with dance fighting, it's Do it. definitely <laughs> worth checking out. Well, next month, might as well get the set here. Um, it's not going to be dance fighting, but there will be plenty of fighting. And we'll still be with puppets, but of not stop motion. As for um, uh, the Lunar New Year, we'll be shit changing things up a little bit and discussing a Taiwanese-Japanese co-production with Thunderbolt Fantasy. Um, this is a co-production with the Peely Studios and with um, uh, Nitro Plus and with Good Smile Company. And this is currently available for streaming on Crunchyroll. We Crunchyroll, we'll be covering the first season and the first movie of that. So it's about 11 episodes and then about like an hour long movie. And so we'll be covering that next month. Um, 
no questions from the uh, viewers this time, but hey, there's plenty of time for next month. Um, please feel free to send those to Anime Explorations, that's with two E's, or Anime Explorations Pod with two E's at gmail.com. Um, there is no physical release for uh, Thunderbolt Fantasy as yet, but it is available, again, available on Crunchyroll. We'll have links for that in the show notes. And uh, there is a manga version of it, which is available uh, through or recently licensed by, I want to say, Yen Press. I will have a link to where if you want to pre pre-order that through um, Right Stuff. There'll be a link for that in the show notes as well. Getting anything through those links helps pay for our hosting costs and all that fun stuff. Um, and also, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash count zero OR. Um, and that will do it. So thank you all very much for, uh, for listening. Thanks, guys. Catch you next time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>